What do the Hundred Years' War and the Common Cold have in common? For those of you who may not be as familiar, the Hundred Years' War was this epic saga fought between France and Britain between the 14th and 15th centuries, one side inching their way towards victory while the other pushing them back with their new technological advances. France invented the crossbow and England invented the longbow, and it was these advances which allowed each side to better attack, to better defend, and to persist generation after generation for those 100 years. Survival is the exact same thing. Every animal on this planet, of every shape and size, is competing against one another for our planet's limited resources. And so when one organism gains one beneficial adaptation, its competitor has to gain an even better one. And so this evolutionary arms race has been playing out for billions of years since the inception of life on Earth. As a young girl from Kansas once said, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. But Dorothy forgot the most menacing and dangerous creature of them all, the microbe. Ever since there has been life, there has been disease. And for the 200,000 years that humans have existed on this planet, disease has ravaged our species. So much as stepping on a twig or getting a deep cut or getting bitten by a dog could mean almost certain death from diseases like the bubonic plague or pneumonia. But then about 80 years ago, Sir Alexander Fleming happened upon the first antibiotic. And I do mean happened upon, because growing on those plates that were meant to grow bacteria was also growing a fungus that was secreting a substance that was killing the bacteria on the plate. And so intrigued, he investigated and named that substance penicillin, the first antibiotic. Now, antibiotics work by stopping the major growth mechanisms of bacteria, so your immune system can kill them faster. So think of it as like tying up your, the guy who's trying to beat you up. It's far easier to get away or fight him when he's you know, defenseless. And so what this fungus was doing was essentially committing chemical warfare against that bacteria on the plate that were competing for its resources. And so because of Sir Alexander Fleming's discovery, dozens of other antibiotics and tens, if not hundreds, of millions of lives were saved since. But we have to remember that this evolutionary arms race is still going on, and bacteria have not given up. In the time since, they've been evolving, evolving to better attack, to better defend, to persist against these antibiotics. And so today, the CDC classifies all of these bacteria as antibiotic-resistant strains, which are resistant to one, if not all, of our antibiotics. That's like going back to a time before there were drugs to cure very common diseases, going back to a time where there may not be a cure for your disease. That's kind of a scary thought. And this is not some issue relegated to some distant country. No, this is an issue here in the United States. Because over two million people a year are infected with a drug-resistant strain of bacteria, and 23,000 die. That's compared to about 15,000 deaths from the AIDS epidemic a year. And this trend is only set to get worse, because by 2050, it's estimated that around 10 million people will die globally, and will cost the world economy around $100 trillion. So if this is such an emerging crisis, why not do what we've always done and you know, make more antibiotics? Well, you would think that the rate of drug discovery has increased, but it's actually decreased. Pharmaceutical companies are increasingly unwilling to invest the time, energy, and resources to create new treatments, instead shifting their focus into more profitable areas of treatment, like those for cancer. So, if not through antibiotics, then how are we going to address this emerging crisis? To answer that question, I want to tell you a story. Tom Patterson was a psychiatrist traveling in Egypt about five years ago until he became infected with a drug-resistant strain. And naturally, he received antibiotic treatment in Egypt, but he didn't respond to that. So he was flown back to the United States to be treated at UC San Diego in California, where he received more extensive treatment. Unfortunately, he still didn't respond, and he fell into a coma for three months. And so, with time passing, 
and hope fading, and his doctors becoming increasingly more desperate, they tried something incredible. They flew to Houston, where they collected sewage samples, which they then purified and injected back into Tom. And almost miraculously, he woke up after three days. And after a few months, he made a full recovery. So what was it in that sewage that cured Tom, where his antibiotics failed? The answer is a virus, or more accurately, a bacteriophage, or a phage for short, a virus that will only infect bacteria. So much like you can become infected by a virus and get sick, the same can happen for bacteria and other microorganisms. But while you have trillions of cells to expend, you'll just get a cold and you know, get a runny nose, some aches, whereas bacteria just has its one cell. And so when it gets infected, it'll die. But it won't just die, it dies spectacularly by exploding and releasing thousands of phages from inside itself. But why does that happen and why is it important? So to answer those questions, you have to look at how phages reproduce. Phages are viruses, and all viruses cannot reproduce on their own. They need a host. So in the case of a phage, that host is the bacterium. Here you see phages in green and a bacterium in yellow. And the phages are injecting their DNA into the bacterium. Now, DNA contains the blueprint for life. It's the instruction booklet to make anything that's alive. And so phage DNA contains the instructions to make more phages. So when the phage injects its phage DNA into the bacterium, the bacterium is forced to read that DNA, make more phages, and keep on doing that until it literally explodes, releasing thousands of more phages into the environment to infect more bacteria, which will inject their DNA into that bacteria, make more phages, and repeat the process. These phages are unleashing a zombie apocalypse on bacteria populations. Now, I don't watch much of The Walking Dead. Well, actually, I don't watch any of The Walking Dead. <laughs> but I know if I were a bacteria and I saw phage, I would run, and I'd run fast. But how does, a, how does this relate to people sick in a hospital dying from a drug-resistant infection? I'm privileged to work in the lab of Professor Tobias Dorr here at Cornell University where I work with a very special type of porin, or a pore, which you can think of as a big doorway that inserts itself into the membrane of bacteria and then allows large molecules to come in from the outside of the cell to the inside. And that includes large antibiotics because there are some bacteria whose outer membrane just don't allow these antibiotics to enter. And so they've always been resistant to them and so we've never been able to use those antibiotics. And so, because we've never been able to use those antibiotics on these diseases, they've evolved no resistance to them. So, when you put in this big doorway, this big porin, into a bacteria, these antibiotics can enter, and because they have no other resistance, they'll die, opening up new avenues for treatment for otherwise drug-resistant infections. OK, so we have this porin. How do we get it inside a person sick in a hospital? More importantly, how can we get it inside every single bacteria cell that's making that person sick? Well, the answer is, again, our friend, the phage. Because we can genetically engineer phages to contain this porin DNA, and then the phage will, uh, we can inject the phage into the patient, that phage will do its thing, inject that DNA into the bacterium, and the bacterium will have no choice but to read that porin DNA, create the porin, insert it into the membrane, and voila, you've transformed a previously drug-resistant infection into something that's curable with drugs today, P turning a potentially fatal disease into something curable within a few days. And that's important because this method can save lives, billions of dollars, and potentially decades in efforts to research and develop new antibiotics. Or you could skip the porn entirely and use the phage itself and its reproductive cycle by simply adding a phage 
it'll reproduce by infecting that bacteria, killing them in the process, similar to what we did with Tom. In essence, we are reprogramming life to fight our own lives, enemies, using viruses that could very well kill us with diseases like Ebola or HIV to save our lives by killing the bacteria which are trying to end our lives. Phage therapy is truly one of the new frontiers in medicine, and it is the next step in our evolutionary arms race against bacteria. So, the next time you're at home, sulking on your couch with a pile of tissues on the floor, and your eyes are puffy, and your nose is runny, and your throat is scratchy, and you're drowning in NyQuil, think about how that cold, a virus, could one day save your life. Thank you.